thanks for inviting me, and uh, I'll apologise in advance for having no dolphin, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm Maya Forstatter, I'm a researcher, writer, advisor on sustainable development, particularly related to um, business. I'm not really a data wrangler, but I'm, I use a lot of data, and I'm always um, really grateful when, you know, when I have a question and I find that someone's worked out how to answer it and made that data accessible, and I'm you know, always a bit frustrated when I have a question and no one's, no one's answered it. And so this, this um, presentation is, is sort of about one of those questions. And um, I just remember when I got married, which was quite a long time ago, I, quite, quite a long time ago, and I thought, wouldn't it be great if I could do something for everyone who was coming to my wedding so they could all know who was there and how they knew me? And so I got out my photo, photo albums, you know, you can remember photo albums, and I cut out a picture of everyone's face, and I got a long piece of paper, and I drew a timeline of my life and my husband's life, when we met, when we met everybody, and I started, I thought, wouldn't it be great if there was such, somebody who made such a thing? And I wish I had done something, but I do have it rolled up in my window. And, and so this is a, a sort of idea that's kind of a little analogue, um, but the, uh, the potential is there. Um, so the, so the question, the, sort of, the sustainability question that, that I'm asking is one divided by nine billion. Um, one is the planet and nine billion is the people. So sort of nine billion people by 2050, how do, how do nine billion people live well? Um, currently had a, a seven billion people and sort of saw how many earths how many earths we needed so we won't go into that. Um, and and it's a it's a um, it's the question really about sustainability and I still don't know how to go down point. Oh yeah there we go. Okay. And so just um, this is Oxfam's diagram and it's just another way of ask, asking the same question they've talked about the, um, the limit, the environmental limits, which are sort of the outer limits of the donut, about climate, about water, about biodiversity, soil, land, and then the inside limits are what do people need to live a good life, and can we can we develop the institutions, the technologies, the business models to, to kind of stay in this safe safe space? And at the moment, the answer is no. Um, and so one way of answering that one divided by nine billion question is just straight divide it up, you know, fair shares. Um, and so if you look at, um, sort of the rest of the, the rest of the presentation is pretty much focused on climate change, which is the easiest, um, the easiest example for answering the question because you can answer it for the whole of the planet because a ton of carbon emitted anywhere is the same as a ton of carbon emitted somewhere else. You, you, you also need to ask the same question about water, but then you need to answer it in terms of uh, watersheds and much more locally. So it's sort of, the maths is easiest on, on carbon, but the question does apply to other things. And so if you look at the carbon budget that we have to stay under, to stay within two degrees of warming, and you look at nine million people by 2050, it comes out at about six kilograms of carbon dioxide a day. What does that get you? gets you about uh, 20 miles in a car, keep your house warm, two t-shirts, two meals with water, no alcohol, but these are options. You don't get all four, you can have one. You can eat, you can't go anywhere, you can't be eating on. So, although the fair shares and the equity, um, the equity question is important, it's not the whole answer, because you know, no one will negotiate that settlement. And so, you know, so the real answer is, what are the kinds of vehicles that of added value has to reduce by 10 times? And that's um, as fast as the, as fast as the Industrial Revolution in terms of um, the productivity of, of uh, I mean, sorry, not too fast. That's the same magnitude as the Industrial Revolution in terms of how, um, Man, you know, the productivity of manpower, but uh, twice as fast. So it's a, it's a huge, um, a huge challenge. And so the question is, are we on track? And the answer at a global level is no. Um, but 
in terms of thinking about the companies and the, the products and the decisions that we're that that we're making today to drive towards having those transport systems, manufacturing systems, where we can have an equitable and a good life for, for nine million people. There's tons of data. You know, there's many, many corporate responsibility reports which you know have many nice photographs and pretty pictures in the front, but actually if you turn to the back, they do have data in them which is getting better, some of it's assured, um, there are standards for it, that you know, the, there is data. Um, that's SAP's one which is sort of one of the best and go on their website and play with their data and so you know there is that data. There's the good old carbon disclosure project, um, which we've heard about that for carbon and also they do it for water now. Um, takes that data and crunches it and uh, makes it unaccessible, but but crunches it and comes up with some conclusions. And, and you know then there's things like um, carbon labelling, which Tesco did on milk for a while before they realised that nobody knew what it meant and it was a waste of time, so they stopped. Um, there's, there's a lot of data out there. Um, but, but the problem is, um, none of it really tells you whether we're on track. What it tells you is um, how many tons of carbon a company emitted in a year. If the next year the number's less, well that's good news, probably. Um, if the next year it's more, is that good news or bad news? Well you don't know. You, is, is the company making more or is it making less? Uh, what are the reasons? Um, and there's, there's not really a, a good benchmark to, to be able to assess it. And so all the attempts that we have to do that tend to be kind of marks for effort. They say, um, is the company measuring its carbon emissions? Is it disclosing? Does it have a target? Is there management responsibility at the highest level? All important stuff. But all, none of that either tells you whether we're getting there. And the problem is, nature doesn't give points for effort. Um, each, I, don't, I'm, I won't go into in great detail, but um, there are tipping points, and if you reach a tipping point, you know it doesn't matter if, it's, if the CEO's got responsibility or you've got targets or management systems. There are, there is a, a carbon budget which, if we meet, if, which if we go over, we're in danger of um, environmental tipping points where there's no going back from. Um, and similarly on the other, on the other environmental limits. Um, and the other, the other problem with the with the um, uh, scorecards approach is that not all efforts count. This is um, the proverbial drunk under the lamppost looking for his keys. Um, I don't know if you've heard that story. They said, "Why? Where did you lose your keys?" Said, I think I left them in the bar. Well, why are you looking for them here? He says, "Well, the light's better." And the, <laughs> that's the problem that we have with reporting and the scorecards on carbon. That you know. We look where the light's better, not necessarily where the biggest impacts are. And so, um, the com if you look at sort of the top ten uh, carbon, um, the carbon emission reporters, you know, who have the best systems, there's there are banks and there are pharmaceutical companies and there are um, technology companies and, and computer and IT, and there are no oil companies in there, and there are no. You know there are no power generators in there, and so it, it, sort of giving awards for who are the best companies that don't have huge footprints in the first place. Um, and so we get back to the one over nine billion question, and I'm just going to talk briefly. So there are four companies that I know of that have had a go at trying to come up with a, a way of. Um, a way of communicating and understanding their emissions, their impacts in relation to um, uh, the global limits. This is British Telecom. They came out with this in 2008, um, no, 2009 maybe, just before Copenhagen. Um, and so their, the big innovation that they made was that um, they looked at the, so this is the UK, um, Emissions. This is, so this is UK emissions. This is the point where the government sets a target. These are future. This, that's the target. These are BT's emissions, and that's their target. And the UK target is set in, um, or, or they divided the, the. They took the UK target, which is an 80% reduction, and they worked it out in relation to the UK economy. So they said, 
what's the carbon productivity um, increase that has to happen across the economy in order for, for the whole economy to reach this target? How much does BT contribute to that economy? Therefore, what's our target? And so that so that's how they that's how they did it. And it's different from you'll see a lot of companies will do what are their emissions divided by revenues, but um, um, revenues and GDP are not the same kind of measure. GDP is a measure of added value, whereas revenues is a measure of cash in the door. So the way they did it, they, it's basically a gross ed, oh, what's it here? Um, EBITDA, which is <laughs> yes, earnings before tax, depreciation, and amortisation. It's basically a kind of gross profit measure. Um, so basically, for every pound of for every pound of gross profit BT made, how, how many kilograms of emissions did they did they emit? And then they can relate that back to the um, UK global targets. It's a sort of it's a bit of a wonky measure. It's quite difficult to explain. You know, it's quite difficult to explain as a kind of headline target. Um, so it's more of a way of benchmarking your headline target, and seeing you know is this really serious? Is this good? How's it measured compared to others? It's, you know, you might, you might have a headline target that's easy to communicate, but this is a way of making sense of those headline targets. Um, and Autodesk and EMC have also taken on the same method as BT. And then this one is Puma, the shoe manufacturer, who came out with a environmental profit and loss accounts last year. Um, and so they basically measured emissions, carbon emissions, water, and I think land um, impacts, and they put a monetary value on it. And so that's, um, in order to assume that there is a monetary value, a monetary cost to their carbon emissions, in some ways they're assuming a future in which there is a global deal that puts, that puts um, a value on it. And so it's a sort of two steps away from making a direct li link between carbon limits and what they're doing, but it's in a way that um, expresses it in dollars, which obviously gets the attention of um, investors and people within the company. Um, and so that's four companies that have done it out of you know hundreds that have now reported carbon data for years now, you know, ten carbon disclosure projects have been going for ten years, four companies have had a go at doing this. Other companies say it's too hard, we can't do it, it's a bit wonky. But, you know, there's there's all kinds of reasons they say they, they can't do it. Um, out of the Fortune 250 companies, I think 90% of them report using the Global Reporting Initiative standard, which is a standard for sustainability, sustainability reporting, which they all say they've used. And it's like the third principle of the Global Reporting Initiative standard is this thing, the sustainability context has been in there since the beginning, and everyone's ignored it since the beginning. And it says, if you just report your trends, um, no one will be able to understand it, and it's meaningless. You have to report this thing called sustainability context. And so people have, you know, sustainability context sounds like just talk about the context, and that's what they've done. They've just talked about the context. Nobody's put it in numbers. But that's that's what this is asking, and people are now, start, you know, sort of 10 years later are now starting to say, um, we need to have some numbers for measuring this sustainability context thing. Um, and I think that's an open data challenge. And the reason I think it's an open data challenge is because the, the, sort of the number on the top, the one, obviously it's not a one. This is all the scientific data about carbon emissions, water, um, ecosystems. This is, you know, this is mainly government data and scientific research data. And then the numbers down here, which relate to the products and services that are needed for 9 billion people to live well, is corporate data. With, you know, and some of that is semi-open in the carbon disclosure project in the back of um, reports and you know some of this is semi-open and I, I think there's an opportunity to get a big piece of paper <laughs> cut out people's faces <laughs> draw a timeline and make something meaningful um, and so I so I sort of made a start this is the um, back of the CDP report the carbon disclosure project report where the front of it is is a kind of scorecard points per effort approach. The back of it is the data. So this, they list all the companies, um, I can't remember what these things say, but this is um, their scope one emissions, which is their own emissions. That's their scope two emissions, which is the emissions of their 
energy suppliers, so the emissions of their electricity supply, and that's their scope three emissions, which are a bit dodgy, so we won't go there. Um, but these are their, these two are fairly robust. Um, and so I just had a go to see what you could do with them if you took them out of the back of the report. And so I um, painfully took them out of the back of the report and did this on um, many eyes, which is why it's a bit hard to read. Um, and I, but I hadn't seen anything like this before. And, and sort of what's interesting about it, I think, is that you know all the reports, all the all the awards, you know, a lot of the interest about um, carbon emissions and corporate responsibilities are going on here. And sort of these are, these are reporting, but they're reporting and they're not saying anything. And so just kind of putting those awards in this context, you know, I I thought was. <laughs> Technology, you know, these are the, these are the Siemens and the GEs of the world who are making the technology that that can, you know, that these guys are using. To what extent are they shrinking it or growing it? You know, to what extent is the tele, the telecoms industry, you know, the sort of whole smart um, uh, technology having an effect on on the big emitters? Um, and so that's so that's what I wanted to do. I look at. Um, you know, the big emitters saying, uh, can we find a way of measuring their footprint against the limits? And for the small, smaller emitters, but who have a high indirect impact through their technologies or through their investments, you know, can we make sense of that in the big picture? Um, and I, I think you can. I, I think it'd be great if you could kind of click on one of these and you could see that graph, like the BT graph, and you could see how fast it was going down or up compared to the rest of the sector. Or you could see its profit, its environmental profit and loss, in the same way that Puma did. And the data that's there, and the data that's in their financial accounts, um, and and a little bit of maths, I think we could do that. Um, but I don't know how. So, which is why I was at the last clean web thing in the pub, sort of asking everyone how how do you do this, and then I sort of con convinced them to come and let me ask the question to you. <laughs> so, so the question really is kind of. Um, is it a sensible question? Is someone else already doing it? Um, is it doable? And uh, how would you go about doing it? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> questions. Yeah, yeah um, does anyone have any questions at all for after this? Yes, is it Rory, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, uh, I think you're um, the indirect um, how should I put it? Um, finance investing in higher, low carbon emitters. Uh, that that question is fascinating. Um, one thing I wanted to know about it was, um, in terms of um, who's investing in who, as in which banks are investing in which companies. How I know that there are certainly investor relations, and there's a wealth of information about that. But um, how uh, how open is that actually? It's not so much the, the web, I think it's not that open in terms of the banks because the banks are uh, lending like overnight finance and, and stuff that's not all that open, but in terms of share ownership it is open, so that's more like the pension funds, um, where it's, where it's um, equity shares then that, that is open and that would be probably the first place to look. It's mm. you know, whether whether banks are lending money to um, Okay. You know, who the it's banks are lending to is less is less transparent. Yeah. So I think yeah, it's not like the data is all there and, and ready to go yeah, no. ready to go. But I think there is out of the data that is available, we could do better things the, the, with it. So there's a start there at yeah. least. I mean this kind of reminds me of um in, in the news there was a the hubbub about local councils investing in tobacco companies. Uh, was, was that on the news recently? It has been in the past. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so, uh, anyway, yeah, um, it could be, could be something there. Okay, we've got two more questions before we uh, go and get a few beers, actually. Come in. I have a question. It's related. There's an increase in Kenya for uh, ethical funds, which have actually performed fairly well, which is thought they would. Um, and the ethical funds that, when they make their investments, they pick a set of criteria, which 
they may or may not publicise. Do you know if many of them take into account carbon emissions as opposed to just investing or avoiding investing in generators that are green? Because I know a lot of the funds won't invest in coal or oil, they will invest in renewables. But that does take into account the companies who may be improving or getting worse. Yeah. Their own do they look at that? Do you know? um, there are sort of three flavours of funds. There's the sort of green fund, as you say, the kind of clean tech green funds that invest in renewable, you know, um, specialists in renewables. There are um, the kind of general ethical type funds and things that sort of follow things like the Dow Jones Sustainability Index that will. Um, they will tend, in, in relation to carbon, they tend to take a point for effort approach. So they will reward companies that um, you know, that have a policy, that have management, um, you know, which is which is important. You know, what gets measured gets managed, but um, they're not they're not really going with um, carbon uh, before you know the sort of end results. And then now there's increasingly a move, particularly in the U.S., um, to disinvest in um, in high emit you know in high emitting. Um, power sources and uh, fossil fuel extraction. Um, and the reason is, you know, one, from a, from a sort of ethical and environmental standpoint, but two, because um, those things are going to be stranded assets. If, you know, the argument is that if the world ever gets its act together to avoid climate change, you know, the, the, the shares that you own in Shell are based on having already priced in the value of the oil that's under the ground. And if that oil, if there's no way that that oil can ever come out from under the ground and stay below two degrees or you know even four degrees now we're talking about, then you know what are those shares worth? So there's there's that kind of disinvestment argument, um, we, and there are, yeah there are arguments for and against that. And I think something like this would sort of help to bring a bit more um, a bit more data to that kind of that that discussion. Uh, one more. I don't know everyone there, I really don't, but this is Luke, Luke, Luke as well, we'll get as well, please. That's yes. Hey, Maya. Thank you. Um, I agree. I think it's really important, and it would be a much better game for everyone to be playing if they're playing that game rather than the game they're playing at the moment. Uh, I've got three questions, but I'm only going to ask one, um, which is a lot of what those four companies did, that happened like 2008, 9, 10, mostly. I don't know all of them, but the guy who did that BT has left post now. It hasn't taken over the world, and I'm interested in your analysis as to why that, I mean in a way you could say that that approach started and it died, and, I think and why is that? I, I, I think there are two reasons. I think one reason was, I mean, that Chris Tucker who, who did this, they did it um, in 2009 before Copenhagen when everyone had sort of um, uh, big hopes of a, of a deal that you could tie it to. And, and there wasn't one, and I think that's partly why it died. But I think partly it was allowed to die because companies said it's too hard, and no one challenged them and said it's not that hard. And so, and and you know, maybe it's too late to say that now, but it seems a bit it, it seems a bit silly not to say, you know, it's not that hard. Look, we can do it, and you've been, you know, you've been uh, reporting this data for ten years, and it's stacked up. Why don't we have a go and you know see if it makes sense and, and see if we can use it to, to make sense of claims and conversations? So yeah. I think at the moment, I, I think one reason is that they got away with saying it's too hard. Um, Chris, can I ask a second, a second question? Bill, on. We're really running way behind uh, behind shows actually. It's really really quick. It's really quick. So <coughs> in that case, if it's a new game, then I guess the interesting question is who's going to want to play this game? Because people who want to play the existing game, people with interest, because they can win. So who could win this game? If, if it were offset against GDP, who would win this game? I think, I mean, the, what, the companies that come out well in this, in this measure are companies with a lot of, um, you know, a lot of brand value, a lot of intellectual added value. Companies that come off poorly are ones whose business depends on burning stuff. I mean, it, it's, <laughs> it, it's really basic, but, you know, but then we have all these great big metrics about sustainability, and, and you know, it does come down to that. Um, and I th but I think one one place where this might have kind of currency in the next couple of years is the Sustainable Development Goals, which are being negotiated for 2015, where 
I don't know if the Millennium Development Goals had environment as like goal number nine and nobody knew quite what to do with it. And in Rio, where they didn't agree anything, they did agree to have this commission and set some goals. And the, the new goals are meant to have sort of environment and, and development much closely aligned. So they'll have things like a goal on, I mean probably, a goal on energy access linked to um, the environmental impact of, of fossil fuels. Um, you know, a goal on water access linked to a goal on sustainable water supply. So, so that kind of conversation about um, link, you know, linking um, what our, what our technologies can deliver for people and what they um, and staying within the limits, I think, has some currency. And also the, the limits conversation, I think, has, has kind of come back again um, with the Rockstrom seven uh, seven things, whatever they're called, um, and that's going to get into the, the sustainable development goals conversation. So I think it is time to 